Okay, welcome to class eight of our educational session, uh, Cannabis 101. My name is Stephanie. Hi, I'm Anita. I am for today's class, we're gonna be talking about the past, present, and future of cannabis, uh, with a part one with a focus on the past or history of cannabis. Let's get right in here. For today's objective, uh, we will be going over highlights of cannabis past. All right, so we wanna dig right into the history of cannabis. Some find history interesting. I'll assume you do also, or you wouldn't be tuning in. Cannabis has a long history, so we will just touch on some of the important events. I encourage everyone to explore the history of cannabis in more depth and to get a full understanding of how we vilified a perfect plant provided for us to use as a medicine, fun, and as food. We will touch briefly on the topic of hemp due to its own complicated past. Our hope is that at the end of our presentation that you understand how misled we were concerning the medicinal effects of cannabis and how it is that we are 70 years behind in true research. So cannabis has been used around the world for over 5,000 years for pleasure and as medicine, as well as many applications for the hemp industrial plant. During that time, there have been zero deaths from overdose from cannabis, making it one of the safest medications and recreational substances known to man. So why did we criminalize it? Well, that's a very good question. So Steph and I will try to shed some light on the history of cannabis and where we are headed as medicine and beyond. Uh, when we started this session, we found it so challenging to make the information brief enough for one session. So we are going to discuss just the past today, um, the present in our next presentation, and then the future of cannabis. So let's get started. So back around 2900 BC is the first um, known uh, or earliest recorded dates of cannabis used as a medicine. And then in 15,000 BC was the earliest written reference to medical marijuana in Chinese pharmacopias. By 1400 BC in the book of Exodus, there's references to holy anointing oil made from cannabis. And of course, my favorite um, is Genesis 1 to 9, saying that he gave us uh, every tree, every plant to bear fruit, uh, to provide food for us, food and medicine. Um, in about 1000 BC, Bang was a drink of cannabis and milk used in India and as an anesthetic. I think Bang has a different terminology today. Yeah. We um, have bang bars on the menu. Bang bars, all so right. Giving tribute to that. Drink it with your milk. Uh, in 600 BC, Indian medicine treaties um, cites cannabis as a cure for leprosy. Wow. So it goes back a long way. All right, now we're we're headed to 200 BC. Um, in the ancient times, uh, ancient Chinese texts recommend marijuana for more than a hundred ailments at that time. So again, in 30 AD, Jesus allegedly uses anointing oil made with cannabis. The ancient recipe for this oil recorded in Exodus includes over nine pounds of flowering cannabis tops extracted into a hen of olive oil, which is uh, about 117 pints, and with a variety of other herbs and spices. Residues of cannabis have been detected um, in vessels from Judea and Egypt and in a context indicating it's medicinal as well as visionary use. We're gonna have to do the math on that and see what today the conversion would be to make a small batch. Yeah, that, well, and hen, I'm glad that they, that yeah, we gave us it. kind of what that is in these, right. in today's terms. Uh, another one on the slide here, cause we're not gonna read them all for you, but just to highlight some of the more interesting ones, uh, for me, was uh, Chinese surgeon Hao To used cannabis and resin wine as an anesthetic. So Dr. To performed surgeries such as organ grafts, resectioning of the intestines, laparotomies, and other surgical interventions were rendered painless by means of 
Mayao, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, an anesthetic made from cannabis, resin, and wine. Wow. You wow. Know, to replace today's anesthesia. So they, they, our ancestors knew this. It's amazing. Now we're headed into the 1500 through the 1800 periods. Uh, hemp is used during the Middle Ages, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for more than a thousand years before the time of Jesus until 1883 AD. Cannabis hemp was our planet's largest agricultural crop with hemp producing the majority of the earth's fiber, fabric, lightning oil, medicines, paper, and incense. Okay. It's so interesting to learn that. Um, another one I'm going to point out here, Thomas Jefferson grows hemp at Monticello, and we're going to talk about um, uh, the acreage and how that uh, came to be. The one I want to highlight right now on this slide is in 1799, Napoleon brings cannabis back to France in 1799. The cannabis was investigated for its pain relieving and sedative effects in Europe and then became more widely accepted in Western medicine. In Jack Harris' book, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, there is an entire chapter dedicated to explaining how hemp was involved in the War of 1812. Wow. Um, in the author's notes, he writes, and I quote, my intention is that our children are taught a true, comprehensive history in our schools, not watered down nonsense that hides the real facts and makes the War of 1812 totally unintelligible and seemingly without rhyme or reason when taught in schools by teachers who don't have the foggiest reason why it was fought. He goes on to say that it's no wonder that our American school teachers themselves don't have an understanding of why this war was really fought. Um, or they may be too intimidated to teach it. I thought that was a good point. Uh, Jack calls the chapter in this book, The Hemp War of 1812. That's a good read. We suggest that you read yeah, it. Definitely. Okay, now we're, we're heading into the 1840s uh, through the early 1900s. Um, marijuana was added to the U.S. pharmacopoeia. The U.S. Census counted 8,327 hemp plantations. And as I mentioned with uh, Jefferson and Monticello, Monticello, the minimum in order to have a hemp plantation was 2,000 acres. So that doesn't probably include all the small growers. No. Some farms, right. family farms. But they specifically oh. had hemp plantations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, marijuana was listed as a useful drug for the treatment of numerous afflictions such as neuralgia, tetanus, typhus, rabies, anthrax, leprosy, tonsillitis, dysentery, insanity, and excessive menstrual and uterine bleeding. It was used as a popular medicine until the time of the Marijuana Tax Acts that was passed in 1937. We'll talk more about that. Yeah, we will. And the only, the other one I want to point out on this slide is in 1906, the Pure Food and uh, Pure Food. That's hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> Pure Food. Pure Food and Drug Act was initially concerned with ensuring products were labeled correctly. So that was their issue. It's got to be labeled correctly. And later began efforts to outlaw products which were safe but not effective in their opinion. Um, this isn't related to cannabis, but I thought an interesting example uh, was the attempt to outlaw Coca-Cola in 1909 because of its excessive caffeine content. Uh, caffeine had replaced cocaine as the active ingredient in Coca-Cola in 1903, and it reached a settlement with the United States government to reduce the caffeine amount. Uh, in addition to caffeine, this uh, Pure Food and Drug Act mandated that drugs such as alcohol, cocaine, heroin, morphine, and canna cannabis be accurately labeled with contents and dosage. So cocaine, heroin, cannabis, and other drugs continued to be legally available without prescriptions as long as they were labeled correctly back then. Wow. I wanted to mention too, Jack here mentioned this in the book, but um, he said throughout history, various uh, prohibition and temperance groups succeeded in banning the uh, preferred recreational substances that others like, like alcohol, yeah. tobacco, and of course cannabis. But Abe Lincoln um, responded in 1840 to 
the reprehensive mentality <clears throat> when he said, <clears throat> excuse me, prohibition goes beyond the bounds of reason in that it attempts to control a man's appetite by legislation and makes crimes out of things that are not crimes. I found that very interesting. Okay. A prohibition law, he said, strikes a blow at the very principles upon which our government was founded. Abe Lincoln said that. Abe Lincoln said oh that. Gosh. I'm glad you said that. Interesting stuff. All right, so we're up to 1915, 1927 in that time frame. 10 states passed marijuana prohibition laws. In 1918, up to the uh, Second World War, or First World War, I'm sorry, pharmaceutical cannabis was entirely imported from India and Madagascar. But in 1913, the Department of Agricultural Bureau of Plant, Plant Industry announced that it had succeeded in growing domestic cannabis of equal quality of the Indian cannabis. When foreign supplies were interrupted during World War I, the U.S. became self-sufficient in cannabis. And then by 1918, some 6,000 pounds were produced annually, um, all from pharmaceutical farms uh, east of the Mississippi. So that's very interesting. Um, also interesting, 1930, the word marijuana increased in the U.S. Um, some people did not know that marijuana and cannabis were the same thing. Um, you're going to talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the AMA, yeah. Yeah. In 1930 also, as demand for marijuana-based medications accelerated, pharmaceutical terms attempted to produce to produce consistent, potent, and reliable drugs from hemp. By 1930, at least two American companies, uh, Park Davis and Eli Lilly, were selling standardized extracts of marijuana for use as marketed, um, even MJ cigarettes for asthma. Really? From a pharmaceutical company. Um, it also was in 30% of our pharmacopoeia at yeah. that time. Yeah. So we knew it was a medicine long ago. But by 1930s, it was clear that, um, are we up to, yeah. yeah. So up to 1930, it was clear that prohibition had become a po public policy failure. The 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution had done little to curb the sale, production, and consumption of intoxicating liquors. And while some crime flourished, tax re revenue withered. With the U.S. government stuck in the throes of the Great Depression, money trumped morales, and the federal government turned alcohol to quench its thirst for desperately needed tax money and put an estimated half a million Americans back to work. Sounds familiar today? Most people will agree that the war on drugs has been a total failure and has ruined more lives um, than cannabis ever will. So after the end of the prohibition, alcohol prohibition, um, in 1930, Henry Anslinger was appointed commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. In 1930, Congress consolidated the drug, drug control effort in the FBN, led by the endless resourceful commissioner, Henry Jacob Anslinger, who became the architect of the national prohibition. His case rested on two fantastical assertions. One, that the drug caused insanity and that it pushed people towards horrendous acts of criminality. Anslinger was the force behind the propaganda film Reefer Madness, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Then in 1933, William Randolph Hearst plays a role in denouncing marijuana. In 1933, marijuana became the target of government control. Sensationalistic stories linked to violent uh, acts to cannabis consumption. 
Many of the most outlandish stories appeared in newspapers published by none other than William Randolph Hearst. Hearst reportedly had financial interest in the lumber and paper industries, and he sought to eliminate the competition from him. And then I believe there's a marital relationship between Anslinger's wife and William Randolph Hearst. Yes. Maybe it's his daughter Nephew or something. Nephew-in-law or something. It's something in there. The Emperor Wears No Clothes, yeah. I believe he referenced this. There's that. a family tie there. Yes, there is. Total uh, corruption. Total shock to learn these things. <coughs> I know, right? right? Okay. So then in 1936, the Bureau of Narcotics urged federal action to control marijuana. Anslinger maintained that the drug use was a plot of civic corruption, a public enemy seeking to destroy the community. Sounds to me like he needed to be dosing instead of making it corrupt. <laughs> but guess what? He succeeded. Um, Unfortunately. In, in, right? In 1936, new medications supplant marijuana as treatment for pain, such as aspirin, morphine, and other opiate-derived drugs all of which help replace marijuana in the treatment of pain and other medical conditions in Western medicine. Now we all know where the opiates got us. Right. Then in 1936, Reefer Madness is a morality tale of how reefer addiction ruins the lives of its young pro protagonists and gets a lot of people killed, sexually compromised, and committed to lunatic asylums. So Reefer Madness began at, um, its cinematic life in a 1926 cautionary film entitled Tell Your Children. This was financed by a small church and um, it was intended to scare the living bejesus out of every parent who viewed it. So after the film was shot, however, it was purchased by the notorious exploitation film maestro Dwayne Esper. Um, who took the li liberty of cutting in salacious inserts and slapping on the sexier title, Reefer Madness, before distributing it um, on that exploitation circuit. I didn't even know there was one. But today the film is a cult phenomenon, uh, dwarfed only by the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and Reefer Madness is still a bona fide kind of catchphrase. So... It all gets better from here. Well, that explains a lot. Right? It does. So, 1937, the Marijuana Tax Act leads to a decline in marijuana prescriptions and virtually criminalizes cannabis um, and promoted by Anslinger. After the passage of the act, prescriptions of marijuana declined because doctors generally decided it was easier not to prescribe marijuana than to deal with the extra paperwork that was um, imposed by the new law. Or lose their license. Oh, uh, yeah. Right? Even today's doctors worry right. about that when they need they it. They do. They do. I know. So, 1942, marijuana um, was removed from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia. Um, yet after the Japanese invasion of the Philippines, that cut the supply of manila hemp. So the same year, the government distributed 400,000 pounds of hemp seeds to produce 42 tons of fiber. 42,000 pounds. 42, 000, 42, 000. 000, you're right, 42,000 pounds. That just, to me, is amazing that you know, they threw them in the same package and yet, oh, but we're still gonna do the hemp part. Yeah. Makes no sense, really. Oh, still me. So then oh. um, in 1951, Oh, was it? No, I'm was sorry. But yeah, the next okay. one is me. So in 1951, the Boggs Act mm -hmm. establishes a minimum pr prison sentence of two to five years for simple possession. Um, the driving force behind the Boggs Act was a mistaken belief that the drug addiction was a contagious and perhaps incurable disease um, and that addicts should be quarantined and forced to undergo treatment. That's terrible. No, I don't think so. All right, and then in 1956, inclusion of marijuana in the Narcotics Control Act leads to stricter penalties for marijuana. 
A first offense now for possession carried a minimum of two to 10 years with a fine of up to $20,000. Unreal. Then in 1964, THC, the main psychoactive component of cannabis, was first identified and synthesized by Robert, I mean, Dr. Raphael Mashulin. Yes. And in 1968, the University of Mississippi becomes the official grower of marijuana for the, cover, for the federal government. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> and we'll okay. talk about that a little bit more, little bit too. More yeah. Okay, now we're entering the era of the war on drugs, late 60s, early 70s. Um, cons the Controlled Substance Act classifies marijuana as a drug with no accepted medical use. And this is in 1970. Uh, Nixon declares the war, his war on drugs. And now I want to highlight in 1972 that the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse petitions the federal government to deschedule marijuana to a Schedule II drug so that doctors could legally prescribe it as they had before. Federal authorities refused to even accept the petition until mandated to do so by a U.S. Court of Appeals in 74. So two years later, they still haven't opened this uh, petition. And then they had to be ordered to properly process it again in 1982. Fast forward 14 years later, after the initial petition in 1996, the DEA finally held public hearings on this issue. Wow. Two years later, this is snail pace here, uh, Judge Francis Young ruled that the therapeutic use of marijuana was recognized by a respectful minority of the medical community and met the standards for other legal medications. And yet cannabis remains listed as a Schedule One drug with no medicinal value. But the federal government has a patent on the cannabis plant as antioxidants as a, and as a neuroprotectant. And Anita's going to talk more about that. Yeah, that one's interesting. So here on this slide, I love the smiling woman. Uh, she is one of uh, the, actually, let me, let me skip ahead. The federal court rules about uh, Mr. Robert Randall's use as marijuana as a medical necessity. In 1976, a man from Washington, D.C., he was afflicted with glaucoma. He um, employed, it was a little used common law uh, called the doctrine of necessity to defend himself against criminal charges of marijuana cultivation. He's using this to treat his glaucoma and his argument is that he's going to go blind if he doesn't have access to the this and they want to arrest him for growing it. Um, and it went to uh, court U.S. versus Randall. A federal judge ruled that Mr. Randall's use of cannabis constituted a medical necessity. Wow. Uh, criminal charges were dismissed. Uh, dismiss against uh, Mr. Randall. So he then filed a petition in line with this ruling. Uh, federal agencies began supplying him with illicit FDA approved access to government supplies of medical marijuana, which made him the first American to receive cannabis for the treatment of a medical disorder from the feds. But, you know, six years previously, it was a completely different, you know, it's just really hard because Again, uh, we want right. to honor Mr. Randall and you know him not giving up. Now, to the woman on the slide, she was one of uh, seven patients uh, from the federal government to supply medical cannabis under the Investigational New Drug Compassionate Use Program. Um, and in 1978, as part of a lawsuit that was settled by the Department of Health and Human, Human Services, the NDA began supplying cannabis to patients, uh, to patients whose physicians applied for and then received such approval from the FDA, which was a big deal back then. I mean, again, they're afraid of losing their license. They fought for their patients. And I think you have a reference to this picture that I like. Um, well, I just read once that this is the way their um, joints came. And the the these metal tins, they were delivered to their home and... That was like a two-week supply. 
Yeah. That's a, to me, that seems like a lot of cannabis. But again, it was coming from University the of Mississippi through the government, and so it was crappy weed, basically. <laughs> crappy, crappy weed. There is a win on this slide. Um, and New Mexico passes the first state law recognizing the medical value of marijuana. We didn't get very far. How about the... Um, 1980, oh, the, Marinol. The Marinol, yeah. So there is a synthetic version of THC um, that has that it's FDA approved. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about in our previous classes that a lot of patients would say that it doesn't, is not as effective as the whole plant because they've isolated a synthetic version of THC. Right. Um, but again, this is the FDA recognizing the value and... And allowing a synthetic version of, of it actual plant and that's 1980 folks all right moving on all right 1981 the u.s government guess what they sell that marinol patent to unimed and the fda approves it for the treatment of nausea in may of 1985 all right all right so in 1986 the anti-drug abuse act increases penalties again for marijuana possession and dealing Possession of 100 plants received the same penalty as the possession of 100 grams of heroin. I think one can do a lot more damage than the other. Um, a latter amendment uh, established a three strikes you're out policy requiring the life sentence for repeat drug offenders and providing the death penalty for drug kingpins. I remember that. In 1990, scientists at the National Institute of Mental Health discovered the cannabinoid receptor system. Yay! <laughs> to this day, though, the endocannabinoid system has yet to be accepted by most medical colleges, university facilities, right. or medical personnel. Um, this alone, to me, is basically criminal. Um, in 1991, our federal government suspends the IND program that she was talking about. The Compassionate IND program for medical marijuana was suspended. Guess why? Because after a number of applications surged in the response yeah. to the AIDS epidemic. Well, we know it can help with AIDS, yeah. so of course they suspended it. All right, next slide. Sorry, we'll move on. Um, in July of 1991, the oncologist surveyed says that cannabis should be available by prescription in a random sample um, survey by members of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the ASCO. 44% said they had recommended marijuana to at least one patient. Wow. 63% agreed with the statement affirming the efficacy of marijuana as um, or in the treatment of emesis and 53% favored making marijuana available by prescription. Again, 1991. Um, in November, then, the first medical marijuana initiative did pass in San Francisco called Proposition P. Yeah. Thank you for the hippies. Yeah. In 1992, scientists discovered the first endocannabinoid. It did take yes. 28 years after the discovery of THC that the brain's first endogenous cannabinoid, anandamide, where vigorous exercise stimulates the re release of this anandamide and the sense of euphoric well-being, um, that comes with a healthy workout, we now know is due to the elevated levels of endocannabinoids. And the ECS in the brain is also believed to help mediate emotions, consolidate memory, and coordinate movement. And I think you yes. had a reference to a magazine article that just came out about the oh, cannabinoids yes. in the brain. So there was an article uh, back in the day that actually says uh, the brain's own marijuana. And it talks about how your brain produces its own marijuana, whether you like it or not. And I thought that was kind of funny. It was it an is. editorial. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, actually, when you taught me this yeah. coming from a research background, it was a game changer for yeah, me. Yeah, right. 
Should be a game changer for everybody. Um, also, oops, oh, one, I'm sorry. One more time. Okay. I just want to finish with, um, in 1994, the final decision in the that 1972 case, wow. court battle over marijuana rescheduling, um, keeps marijuana as a Schedule One. Um, so again, this series of court battles ensued pertaining to this petition for over 22 years. And yet here we are 27 years later and counting. It is time to legalize medical cannabis. Wow. Okay, now we're heading into the mid 90s, late 90s. Uh, California becomes the first state to legalize medical marijuana. Thank you, California. Um, in 97, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine publishes an editorial calling for marijuana to be rescheduled. And I know that when I worked at the hospital for 14 years, this is the journal that the doctors, uh, it's a go-to reputable scholar, scholarly medical journal. And so the New England Journal of Medicine published this article. It was uh, Dr. Jerome Kassiner. Uh It was titled, Federal Foolishness and, Mar and Marijuana. <laughs> Uh, the article states that federal authorities should rescind their prohibition of the medicinal use of marijuana for seriously ill patients and allow doctors to decide which, which patients to treat as they had before. Right. Uh, the government should change marijuana status from that of a Schedule 1 to that of a Schedule 2 and regulate it accordingly. And I mean, this is coming from a physician who published this back in the late 90s. Um, in 97, the NIH uh, actually says that more study is needed to as assess the potential of medical marijuana. Um, the expert panel concluded that further research should address whether marijuana therapeutic benefits can be obtained without the intoxicating effects of smoking the plant. And we know that now. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, medical marijuana advocates um, protested at the conference. Uh, they contended that the National Institute for Drug Abuse has unnecessarily impeded marijuana research by refusing to provide marijuana to FDA approved clinical trials by creating unique bureaucratic obstacles such as requiring the research protocol to be approved by an NIH peer review panel. And so that's where the block is coming in. So they're like, yeah, you can do your clinical trial, but yeah, you but can't have any weed to do it with. Right. Absolutely. Um, I think that's all I've got on that one. Um, we'll just keep... Oh, wait. 1998. Alaska, Oregon, and Washington become the second, third, and fourth state to legalize medical marijuana. All right. Yeah. Good year. Congratulate that. Okay, now we're moving into 97 and throughout. Um, Health Canada announces funding for medical research on marijuana. This is really interesting to me. Uh, the Minister of Health announces clinical trials programs and procedures from exempting from criminal prosecution wow. patients who successfully apply to Health Canada for access to medical marijuana. So you gotta remember folks, they're providing insurance over there. Uh, so um, they shouldn't be put in jail for then applying for access to this medicinal marijuana. So in response to a number of court challenges uh, brought forth by Canadian patients who actually demonstrated and proved that they benef benefited from the use of medicinal cannab cannabis, but then remained vulnerable to arrest and uh, persecution as a result of its status as a controlled substance. Can you say Rick Simpson? Yeah. <laughs> he was one of those. I yes. mean, that's what that story's about. So then in 99, Canada became the second nation in the world to initiate a centralized medicinal cannabis program. So again, this was in 99 and it has evolved to the point where if I am a resident of uh, Canada and I, I am a part of their Health Canada, I can then order my medicinal marijuana straight from the cultivator online and have it paid for and delivered to my house. Someday. someday. <laughs> also just want to point out that Maine becomes the fifth state to legalize medical marijuana. Hawaii becomes the sixth state. 
<laughs> and then we have Colorado and Nevada become seventh and eighth states to legalize medical marijuana. So this is a good slide. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Then in October of 2002, a court rules that the government cannot revoke physician license solely for recommending medical marijuana. Um, that's a victory. Yeah. July of 2003, the U.S. House of Representatives rejects the amendment to stop federal raids on mar uh, medical marijuana patients. This amendment would have forbidden the Justice Department, including the DEA, from spending any money to tear up plants, close down clubs, or arrest patients or providers. Um, the amendment, unfortunately, was defeated by a vote of 273 to 152. Then in October, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services receives a patent. Yes, that's right. The U.S. patent number 6630507B1 is for its medicinal properties which is contrary to the definition of what a scheduled one narcotic should be so therapeutic use of cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants so as of 2003 the u.s government has had a patent on cannabinoids found in the cannabis plant let me repeat that 2003 for 18 years and the slide actually has a screenshot of what the patent looks oh, like yeah. that's the actual patent that's the patent um and then uh just one other thing in 2004 um vermont becomes the ninth state to legalize and november of 2004 montana became the 10th yeah. yay all right, then we get to 2006. Um, Rhode Island became the 11th state to legalize marijuana, but only, I mean, there's got really ugly, only after yeah, yeah. legislature overrode the governor's veto. Yeah. So here the Senate, or their House, first passed it at 52 to 10, and then their Senate passed it 33 to one, but the governor vetoed the bill. He's another wow. one of those similar to Nixon, doesn't care what the people want. He had his own belief system. Um, so then the Senate then had to override the veto by wow. a vote of 28 to 6 and the House 59 to 13. So at that point, wow. the, finally, the law finally took effect. So Thank goodness. Yeah. I mean, how can one person's beliefs just throw everything out of whack? All right, so then in June of 2006, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church voted to support access to medical marijuana for people who have a doctor's recommendation. This is huge. This is one of the first religious groups that um, believed in it. February of 2007, um, the DEA administrative law judge recommended allowing a new source of marijuana for research. Thank you, Judge Bittner. Um, he stated that there is currently an inadequate supply of marijuana available for research purposes. So, That's right. March of 2007, Mexico became the 12th state. And then in February of 2008, the nation's second largest physicians group called for marijuana reclassification and supported non-smoked forms of marijuana. The American College of Physicians or the ACP stated its support for the use of non-smoked forms of THC, research on the benefits of mar medical marijuana, and review of the federal scheduling of marijuana in the exemption from criminal prosecution. Here we are, 08, still battling it out. Oh, and that prompted me, I didn't mention the AMA, no. uh, what went on with that. So the reason why prohibition went through, and uh, in Jack Herr's book, it'll say, you know, who consulted the AMA? Well, they changed it from you calling it cannabis to marijuana and then killer weed from Mexico which the AMA says, well, you changed the name on us and that's how we didn't know to come to these meetings to help prevent that prohibition initially of, of cannabis. 
So lot. thank you for saying the ACP because that made yeah, me think of the lot, AMA. Just lots of corruption in the, the whole it's thing. It's pretty obvious, yeah, at this point. All right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that means you. I have no idea where are we. That is me. Of All right. So okay. very interesting. Oh, In yeah. 2008, two pounds of cannabis. Uh, so tombs in China were actually excavated, and then they revealed this two pounds, uh, roughly, of cannabis uh, in a 27-year-old grave of a shaman. And so that was part of his belongings. Okay, and I like to think about, okay, two pounds dried out over it's how many years? Probably not. It was a lot of weed. I wouldn't want to smoke it, but it, I'm glad they found it. That was a lot of weed back then. Wow. Uh, Michigan becomes 13th state to legalize medical marijuana. Uh, February 2009, Attorney General Eric Holder released a statement uh, that on February 25th, 2009, the DEA would end its raids on state-approved cannabis dispensaries. During the Bush administration, DEA agents uh, bragged, actually, about shutting down between 30 and 40 medical marijuana dispensaries and, and bragged about it. Yeah. Bragged. Uh, New Jersey becomes the 14th state to legalize medical marijuana. Um, huge one here on this slide. Um, July 2010, the U.S. Department of uh, Veterans Affairs relaxes marijuana rules for veterans. Um, this one's close to our heart. The department released a directive stating that veterans who participate in legal state medical marijuana programs programs will no longer be disqualified from substance abuse programs, pain control programs, or other clinical programs. Um, so our beloved veterans were being denied life-saving services and access to medical cannabis, and we're really thankful for this change. Yeah, no doubt. Um, medical marijuana becomes legal in Washington, D.C. That very same year? Very same year. And then Arizona, excuse me, Arizona becomes the 15th state to legalize right. medical marijuana. It's amazing. Here we go. Okay. Rock and roll, as they say. <laughs> and then Delaware's on board and becomes the 16th state to legalize medical marijuana. Um, the one I want to point out here on this slide, because we don't want to just read the slides to you. November of 2011, there's a study that finds legal medical marijuana reduces fatal car accidents. Uh, the study in 2011 compared traffic deaths over time um, in states with and without medical marijuana law changes, and the researchers found that fatal car wrecks dropped in the states that had legalized the medicinal use of cannabis, uh, which is largely attributed to the decline in drunk driving with those states that allowed the medicinal use of cannabis. Uh, the researchers also noted that there was no increase in cannabis smoking by teenagers in states that legalized the medical use of cannabis because that was a concern at first. And so the researchers were able to prove that this is not the case. It's still a concern even when you attend local um, uh, people who are against it. Sure. That's their first argument is kids will start using it and uh, people will get killed in more car accidents. No, we've proven that. I'm thankful for this study. Yeah. Um, and then Connecticut becomes 17th uh, state to legalize medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. New Hampshire becomes the 19th state to legalize mm -hmm. medical marijuana. Uh, the interesting thing with this one I thought was there was a House Bill 573 also called for the creation of a therapeutic use of cannabis advisory council mm. um, that in five years, so in 2018, would have been required to issue a formal opinion on whether this program should be continued or repealed. And because the program is still ongoing, that lets me know, even though we haven't seen this report, that there has been value and that they, they did in fact find that it should be continued because it continues today. Same thing with Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Ours was a pilot program, which became a permanent program. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, and did I, I did, yep. I did say New Hampshire. Yeah. Okay. August, uh, Illinois becomes the 20th state to legalize medical marijuana. And then we passed recreational just last yeah. year in 2020. Um, this one's interesting. August of 2013. Dr. Sanjay Gupta came out in favor of medical marijuana. 
He stated that he mistakenly believed the DEA listed marijuana as a Schedule I substance because of sound scientific proof. Surely they must have had quality reasoning as to why marijuana is in the category of the most dangerous drugs that have no accepted medicinal use and high potential for abuse. He said they didn't have the science to support that claim and I now know that when it comes to marijuana, neither of those things are true. It doesn't have a high potential for abuse and there are very legitimate medical applications. He said, we've been terribly and systemically, systematically, sorry, I can't read, uh, misled for nearly 70 years in the United States. He said, I apologize for my role in that. And Aww. at one time, wasn't he going to be our a surgeon general? Yeah. Like the head doc? Oh my gosh. Yeah. And thank you, Sanjay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dusset. Um, then in August of 2013, um, it was a hot month for cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, the Justice Department announced an update to its federal MJ enforcement policy in the light of recent state ballot initiatives that legalized under state law the possession of small amounts of marijuana and provided for the regulation of marijuana production, processing, and sale. This left enforcement up to the state and local jurisdictions. April of 2014, Maryland became the 21st state. May of 2014, Minnesota, 22nd. July, New York becomes the 23rd state. And then in December of 2014, I'll finish up with this one. Um, the new law bans the Justice Department from using funds against medical marijuana states where it is legal. The trillion spending bill that passed that week and signed into law by President Obama on that day included a provision that blocked the Justice Department from spending any money to enforce a federal ban on growing or selling marijuana in the 23 states that had moved to legalize it for medical use. Um, that would just marked a huge shift for Congress for which for many years has sided with federal prosecutors in their battle with states over the um, liberalization of drug laws. But um, Representative Dana Ro uh, Ro 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 You got I'm, it. I'm sure I don't. Uh, Rob Acker, a, a Republican from California, he was one of the authors of the medical use provision. Um, and he made the case to his colleagues on the grounds that many conservatives can understand state, states' rights. Right. So in a statement, he said his amendment would force the federal government to respect state sovereignty on the question of medical marijuana. So, thank you. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, thank you, Rob. Rob Bucker. For um, for mispronouncing. Bucker? Bucker. Yeah, I do apologize for that. All right. Then in, um, next slide, May of, t or was it May 2015, the governor of Puerto Rico legalized medical marijuana. In June of 2015, the government um, removed obstacles to marijuana research. Um, it was announced that it would take effect, immediate effect, and a, a long-standing bureaucratic obstacle, privately funded medical marijuana research was removed. The public health service review process had been a subject of particular discernation among researchers and advocates that step was not required to study any other drug including cocaine and heroin right. so the phs review was nearly identical to the one performed by the fda and sometimes it could take months so the announcement of the elimination of the phs review of non-federally funded research protocols involving marijuana was a huge win for yes. cannabis. Amen. 
Then in April of 2016, the DEA considers moving marijuana to a less restrictive schedule. Um, I feel like we've heard this all yeah. before. Um, but then on August 11th of that same year, the DEA re declined to reschedule it, but they did help foster research by expanding the number of DEA registered marijuana manufacturers. Um, this change would provide researchers with more varied and robust supplies of quality marijuana. Right. And this change did kind of illustrate the DEA's commitment to working together with the DSA and the NIDA to facilitate research concerning marijuana and its components. So um, I guess we give them a check yeah. mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In June, Ohio became the 25th state, not listed here. Um, Arkansas became the 26th, Florida the 27th, yes. and North Dakota the 28th. West Virginia became the 29th state, and in 2017, June, Mexico legalized wow. medical uh, marijuana. Now we get to 2018. Um, enter the U.S. <laughs> Surgeon, I mean, the U.S. General Attorney General Jeff Sessions, um, he rescinded that policy by Obama's Justice Department that had generally barred federal law enforcement officials from interfering with marijuana states in the states where the drug was legal. Sessions policy would let U.S. attorneys across the country decide what kinds of federal resources to devote to marijuana enforcement based on what they had see had what they saw as pri priorities in their districts. So officials at that time could not say what the ultimate impact would be on the legal industry or whether it would lead to more cannabis convictions and prosecutions, nor was it clear how the memo might affect the um, states where marijuana is legal for yeah. medical purposes. Uh, I remember those days. You didn't know Scary. if, uh, you know, you would go to work and somebody was going to come in and ready to shut you down yeah. and throw you in prison like you'd seen jail. years ago. Uh, Nerve-wracking times. So then in June of 2018, um, this one I got to tell you gets my goat about as much as the U.S. patent. But the FDA approved its first marijuana-based drug. The U.S. FDA approved Epidiolex, a CBD oral solution for the treatment of seizures associated with two rare and severe forms of epilepsy, Lenogestant syndrome and Dravet syndrome, in patients two years of age and older. This is the first FDA approved drug that contains a purified drug substance derived from marijuana. Don't misunderstand me. I am so glad it's helping children suffering from those conditions. But how can our government still keep cannabis as a schedule one drug, knowing that they have what they've known for all these years? It just blows me away. Oh, and then in 2021, Alabama has become legal, but we don't have that one listed. Oh. Yeah, fun stuff. Good job, Alabama. Okay, now we're heading into um, December 2018. Uh, on this slide, the 45th president signs a bill legalizing industrial hemp and its derivatives with less than 0 0.3 THC. Uh, the FDA issued a statement saying that despite uh, the new status of hemp, CBD is still considered a drug ingredient and remains illegal to add to food or health products without the agency's approval. Um, in part two of this class, uh, where we focus on the present and future, we're going to share how hemp, uh, as some say, uh, especially Jack Hare, can save the world. Uh, hemp is the Earth's number one biomass resource. The intentional suppression of information by the government has resulted in no public knowledge of this incredible potential of the hemp fibers or its uses. And we're excited to share that with you. Uh, Mississippi and South Dakota become the 31st and 32nd state to legalize medical marijuana. 
Um, the U.S. House passes a marijuana decriminalization bill. Here we go again. Uh, the House passed a marijuana decriminalization bill that would remove cannabis from the con excuse me, Controlled Substance Act, as well as add a 5% tax on cannabis to help people most affected by marijuana criminalization and to fund community and small business grants. Um, although we know not yet whether this will be passed, it is the first time either chamber has passed such an act, and the act was supported by Vice uh, President Kamala Harris. Is this the Moore Act? Do you know? I think it is. I okay. don't know why I didn't We'll tell more that. about that one on the present history. Um, history. Yes, we will, we'll, we will keep up with this, um, yeah, definitely. Um, and then we go to May 2021. Mississippi medical marijuana effort was thwarted by an outdated constitutional requirement and wasn't passed. Tell them about it. Okay. <laughs> so it's just to get you. Ole Miss has been able to detect that cannabis has gone up in THC content. Um, now compared to the 60s and 70s, they estimate over 200%. So the two, THC content has gone up approximately 200% over the years. Um, how they know this is due to the program that allows them to test on the confiscated cannabis of those that are incarcerated uh, for possession. To each their own. <laughs> just keep moving. Um, so for this this slide here, and we're, get, we're coming to a close here, we agreed we could have had an entire class uh, dedicated to the medical marijuana advocates, pioneers, and trailblazers for the legalization and medical value of cannabis. And maybe we will, maybe, uh, maybe and then we'll have a future class. Uh, but for now, we've just highlighted a few. Um, we've got here on the list, I wanted to just uh, note about Tommy Chong, um, longtime comedian and movie star and half of the still working duo Teach and Chong. Um, he actually spent nine months in federal prison for running a bong business back in the day. Um, some marijuana advocates, um, may object to his comic portrayals of the hapless, confused, or vacant stoner in films and TV shows and recordings. Um, but essentially these benign portrayals, uh, showed cannabis users as harmless or even lovable, uh, which is a 180 degree, uh, turn from the menacing sex craze, marijuana demons in films such as Reefer Madness. Um, Chong announced in 2012 that he, he is fighting prostate cancer. Um, and this is, I'm just going to read you his quote. I'm treating it with hemp oil with cannabis. It doesn't really cure it, but it gets the cancer cells so stoned that they forget where they are. <laughs> still a comedian. I just wanted to share that with you. Yeah, still a comedian. Um, and then we have on here, uh, Dr. Grinspoon was a senior psychiatrist at the Massachusetts Mental Health. Center for over 40 years at Harvard Medical School. He is a emeritus professor. Uh, he's been a proponent of cannabis since the publication of his book, Marijuana Reconsidered in 1971. Um, I, I wanna read that book actually. He also published Marijuana, The Forbidden Medicine. Um, in addition to his professional uh, research, which he's been working to demystify cannabis for a long time, he says that cannabis eased the pain of his son's battle with leukemia. And again, these are just a few. Um, Jack Hare, we've got a, uh, his book up here, The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Uh, we suggest it's a really good read. You can get it online. Yes, you can get it online, yeah. Uh, again, you can contact us. Um, Drake helps with the application assistance. Anita um, offers free consultations here in the office. Um, we've got a list of our other classes. Uh, actually, you can go to our uh, website at trinitymmj.com and there is a video resources tab and then you can check out the other videos if you're interested there. We also want to mention that we're running a special. If you have stuck it out through the <laughs> past history of cannabis, um, please stop in at the university store. Glenn. Or please stop in at the Glenn oh, store and pick up a $10 off coupon. Um, just let them know that you attended the June um, class. Yes. 
and they will be happy to give you that coupon. All right. Do go to the university store, just not for the coupon. Yes. Get the uh, coupon so here, and them. then go over to the medical. And you can use record. it at the medical place, this coupon, mm -hmm. or you can use it here, and you'll just need your first name. Yeah. Um, we want to ask you to stay tuned for part two of the series. We're with a more of a focus on the present and then the future of cannabis. Absolutely. So many thanks for your time. Uh, we're most grateful to share this. Um, and we're going to cut out because we're a few minutes over already. But if you have any questions um, or comments, please e email them to us here at Trinity. Thank you. Take care. Bye now.